Okay, good afternoon. Good is uh, euphemism. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Uh, I actually thought that uh, I would be alone here with Dennis with the camera, and yeah. then I would send an email to all of you and say, well, you can watch it on, on the IS um, uh, website. So thank you for making the effort. Many of you coming from the East Bank towards the West Bank with these terrible conditions. I am from Spain. I can understand this is really something extreme. So, and I wonder how everything functions still. <laughs> so, uh, well, the topic that uh, I would I'd like to address today is collective memory of mass atrocities, collective memory of large scale political violence, the type of violence that we are discussing in the framework of human rights, uh, genocide, state terrorism, uh, the aftermath of civil war, terrorism. The fact is that we have a culture of memory, a globalized culture of memory, and I would like to try to identify which are the components, which are the problems of a globalized culture of memory, of memory of atrocities, and um, try to also to link the notion of memory from a sociological perspective to the discussion of human rights that we have seen until now. The title of this, of the collaborative, is Refraining Mass Violence, which means that we may look at, at mass violence from different perspectives, that we can interpret it, that we can revisit mass violence, that we'll represent it in many different ways, and that our understanding and of the events by using different terms will, will vary. So this is the, the issue that I'd like to cover. I would like to look at human rights from a different angle, from a different perspective. Not from a normative perspective, not what you usually think from a legal perspective of human rights, but think human rights as a discourse, and even think human rights as a memory frame, as a memory narrative, as a way of looking at those events, which is very much embedded in our contemporary way of thinking of mass violence. So this is also an attempt to keep some distance to the way we think today of mass violence and do it and give a little bit of perspective in order to address some of the issues, some of the consequences of looking at mass violence in this particular way. So I, I, I have structured the talk in the following way. First, I would like to try to look at some of the notions and concepts and theories of collective memory, and then see the new developments in the sociology of collective memory, which are these terms cosmopolitan, multidirectional, post-memory, cultural trauma, which are useful theories and also useful um, conceptual tools to look at different cases, and then we will try to see this link between memory human rights, memoria, verdad, justicia, memory, truth, justice, this trilogy that we all we see often connected, we saw it two weeks ago in the, when we, in, in the film Granito, as something that goes together, that is linked. And as I said, may, maybe this concept is a particular, particular way, a particular frame of looking at those events. And I will try to label them or to categorize them in a shift from a memory regime which is much more politicized, which I call the no pasaran, towards a shift which is the nunca mas, the never again, so from the will shall not pass to the never again, and we'll look at memory politics in Spain and in Argentina, uh, giving some examples. So let us start with collective memory theory, and any sociologist will of course um, go to the totem of sociological thought, which is uh, Emil Durkheim. It could be also Max Weber or Karl Marx. But in this case, Emil Durkheim is probably uh, the first um, uh, sociological theorist uh, um, who incorporated the notion or the idea of a collective or of a social memory uh, into his thought. And what he noted is that societies require continuity and connection with the past 
to preserve social unity and cohesion. In other words, the link with the past, be it, a, it can be a real past, or it might be a legendary past, a narrative of a past will lead to cohesion, to bonding among people. The big question of Durkheim was, is what holds a society together? So having a narrative of a common past uh, is part of that cement, the, that cementation of society that builds cohesion, that builds unity and um, solidarity. Um, the Durkheim, uh, in his, uh, his case study, was the um, uh, cultures, the Aboriginal cultures of Australia and Totemism in Australia, although he had it much closer. He was the seventh generation of a dynasty of rabbis, so he could have also used clearly Jewish collective memory as an example of how memory works. And this is probably, for, for a, in, in a Western context, much uh, closer and understandable. We can quote the Bible here in Deuteronomy 15, 15. Always remember that you were a slave in Egypt and that the Lord your God redeemed you, took you out with a strong hand. I'm sure you're all familiar with this, with this verse. So here, you actually have exactly how memory works. You have a narrative of the past. It doesn't matter if it's real or if it's legendary, and it is retold, and it is retold cyclically. Um, every year, actually, and anybody who's familiar with the Jewish tradition knows that this is read in during Passover, and the communities or the families will say, we were slaves in Egypt. It means we, the we is strengthened, the collective uh, identity of a group, of a people is strengthened, the story is retold from one generation to another, and the link with that past is reinforced, strengthened, and repeated on a, in a cyclical manner. So that was basically what, what Durkheim identified as how memory works and that connection between group and um, group identity and uh, group um, memory. So Halkwax, I go back to this this uh, chart. He was, Maurice Halpax was a student of Durkheim and um, also in, in Paris and he's the first sociologist that uses the term collective memory in itself and his work is considered a foundational framework for the study of societal remembrance. He developed much more what already Durkheim had said and if we, have, we summarize uh, Halpax in phrases or want to point out the main uh, elements that distinguish Halberg's understanding of memory, he is basically a constructionist, and that's a sociological approach to this. He is also a presentist, meaning that adopting this instrumental presentist approach to collective memory uh, means actually that remembrance is always shaped by the needs of the present. So present issues, present understanding will always shape representations, constructions of the past. Halifax also developed much more that connection between group and memory. And he said that, he suggested that individual private memory is, can only be understood through a group context. There is no such a thing as an individual member. We always think, think through the group in which we are embedded. And our thinking of our own past is also a context, it is also a consequence of our embeddedness in a group framework. These groups can be a family, it can be organizations, it can be a cohort, it can be a nation state. So that means that there are as many memories as there are groups, and there are as many groups as there are memories. And Halbach would say, and this is important for our understanding of collective memory, or the question that we need to ask us when we look at these global phenomenon is, can there be a shared memory outside of these reference groups, this multiplicity of groups? Well, for Halbach, that's not the case. And the study of collective memory, and also the study, much of the study on nation's memory, like Anderson or Pierre Nora, who's a French historian, 
they are very much uh, fixated, very much centered on this groupal memory structures that are bound by tight social and political groups, which are like the nation or the ethnos, the religious community. So these are those structures that will have a memory and the memory will disappear outside of that group or will be different, radically altered. So the question is what happens when an increasing number of people in societies no longer define themselves or no, the, no longer, no longer design themselves exclusively through the nation or through their ethnic belong belonging? So what I would like to address now is this newer approaches to collective memory that see collective memories beyond the group, beyond the family, the organizational group, or beyond the nation. In a text, this is the text that I want to comment now, this book, Holocaust Memory in a Global Age. And there's another article that I would very much suggest that is called Memory Unbound. which actually directly points to this problem of unbounding group memory, they would say that not only do groups imagine or construct their past, but they will, all, they will also link or have a connection to pasts that are not of them, of, that are not theirs, that are others' pasts. So that's why they will talk about a cosmopolitan memory, and the example that they use is actually the Holocaust, and the process of the Holocaust from being a group memory into being a universal memory. We will look at that with some examples. So they will say there can be shared social memories that go beyond the collectives that have a connection with that specific past experience, in, in terms of experience, in terms of history or genealogy or identity, religious, ethnic identity, what, or, or a, a, any other. So, as I, as I said, the Holocaust would be an example of, or paradigmatic example of this process of deterritorialization of memory, a catastrophic historical event for the community of memory in a strict sense, the religious, ethnic, um, cultural, communi Jewish community. It transcends the group framework and obviously through a process involving different stages and different factors, it becomes a sort of a cosmopolitan and universal memory. What does it mean that actually the way that the event is thought transcends as well group meanings? It has universal meanings, and which are these universal meanings? Well, the Holocaust has been transformed into sort of a universal imperative it makes the issue of universal human rights, tolerance, pluralism, politically relevant to all who share this new form of memory. That's the thesis of Levy and Schneider. So if we want to illustrate this with some images, we can again use uh, the, the Bible. And here we have an expression of group memory in a strict sense. Because these are the survivors themselves in a, uh, after the events in a DP camp, in a displaced person camp, who produce a representation of memory which is connected to the Jewish past in itself. And they say here, we were not slaves of the Pharaoh in Egypt, but, or they say it differently, we were slaves of the Pharaoh in Egypt, but we were slaves of Hitler in Nazi Germany. So connecting the ancient past legendary mythical past or the history of the people of Israel with the events that they just have lived through. So an example, clear example of group memory. The meaning that are derived from the event obviously makes sense for the group. They're religious. And uh, they, build, they, they, they make sense for the Jews as a Jewish people having overcome also this catastrophic event. And here's this survivor's Haggadah, which is this book that was produced in the 
displaced person comes in 1948, 1946. Obviously, a big leap, a big step forward to use Holocaust Memorial Museum would be exactly the contrary, would be cosmopolitan memory in that sense. This is what, uh, this is the mission statement of the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. Obviously, this is not any more group memory. It is a universal. It's not a particular. It's a universal. So that's that's the example that Lillian Snyder have uh, underlined here and have analyzed. Another example actually would be comparing these two museums: a museum in New York, the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust, which is a Jewish institution, and the Museum of Tolerance, which is also a Holocaust museum, and that had the, that that is a secular museum whose mission is understand the event as an example of hatred, bigotry, and intolerance. So they're not saying there are particular, but no particular Jewish meanings derived from the event. So another example of this. And here, of course, I could not do otherwise than bring a Spanish example, which is the king of Spain and, um, and the queen with former president Zapatero commemorating the Holocaust in 2006, an official Holocaust Memorial Day ceremony as it exists now in over 35 states in the world, states that have no particular connection among many of them with the event themselves, but it is the memory of the Holocaust and prevention of crimes against humanity, which is an interesting addition to the um, Holocaust Memorial Day, and that understands the event, obviously, in a much broader universalized way. Okay. Now, let us look, take a look at this other work by Michael Rosberg, Multidirectional Memory. But first, let, let me add something about cosmopolitanism. Cosmopolitanism does not suggest a simple one way process in which local elements are multiplied in a globalized context. What Levin Schneider underlines is the fact that there is an interactive and productive relationship between the global and the local, between the universal and the particular, between the universal and the national as well. Actually, the Spanish case this would be a good example for this because what is commemorated here, depending on who is actually in the government, the left or the right, might not be only the Holocaust. It might be also the Spanish Civil War. It might be crimes against humanity in a much broader sense. So there is this interaction, there's this different readings, local readings, national readings, of global uh, memories, of cosmopolitan memories. That's an important point that, that needs to be emphasized. <coughs> Often we have also an appeal to universal symbols, and the Holocaust is such a universal symbol, the term genocide or crimes against humanity are universal symbols that you find frequent appeals to them among different groups, among nation groups or among victim groups, the category of trauma for the purpose of claiming collective status as victims. And so you may find this universal, this use of universal symbols for local particular uses. What we have is a culture of transnational memory whose elements are in global circulation and that are reflected in local, often through recycled, appropriate, uh, appropriated, and even redefined context of very different kinds. All right, now let us look at, at Rothbard's book. Rothbard will, will amplify, will expand with, some, with more examples in uh, this, this idea of memory going in different directions, memory being appropriated by different groups, and also symbols of a universalized, globalized memory being employed in many different ways. But his main thesis is that memory is not a zero-sum game. It's not a competition where one memory will eclipse the other, will make the other disappear. His point is that there are not necessarily winners and losers in, 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 get, in, in, 
among groups getting out their memories of victimhood in the public sphere. So, and he proposes a very, an alternative idea to this competitive memory, which is multidirectional memory. And what he, what he underlines is that social memories are formed in a productive and not, as, not necessarily private process, one that is open to communication and to complex and unexpected intercultural dynamics. In his study, Roswell situates the Holocaust in the context of the processes of decolonization and finds that there is no blocking of other memories. Rather, the opposite, of course. The existing awareness and knowledge of the Holocaust serves as a platform for articulating new claims and new identities based on victimization. That's his thesis. In this sense, the emergence of an awareness of the crimes of Nazism on a global scale probably contributed uh, to the knowledge of other histories and to, the mobili to mobilizing other demands. And we will look at examples now from Southern Europe and Latin America. So we've seen that cosmopolitan and multidirectional, what, what we have here is dynamics of interplay of memories in different directions, different kinds, appropriations, resignifications of memory narratives. Now we have now these other two works which I would like to introduce to you, which emphasize another aspect. But it's, it's not anymore about immediate victims. It can be also generations after, second generation, even third generation that deal with memories of atrocities. And that's mainly what the term post-memory is all about. It's a term that has dominated the field of memory studies in the, in the sphere of literature and the humanities mainly. And it places the emphasis on second and even third generation. According to Marianne Hirsch, the author of this book, Post-memory is the experience of those who grew up dominated by narratives that preceded the, their birth. So it describes a relationship that the generation after bears to the, I quote, personal, collective, and cultural trauma of those who suffered it directly. The experiences were transmitted to them Experiences that were transmitted to them constitute memories in their own right, according to him. And this is something, this is something we need to think about. They constitute memories in their own right, but they were transmitted to them. They didn't live through those events. And they cloud their own life stories with inherited traumas. The, the events took place in the past but their effects continue into the present. So what we have mainly, and there's an Argentinian uh, philosopher, I think, so, I think Sablo, she's a philosopher, or writer, she, she's, she's critic with the term post-memory in the sense that it, well, it was any memory is post. We've seen it, I mean, we, basically when, when Bible is read and the Exodus from Egypt, obviously that is how people are remembering that post. So it's not so much the post dimension, it is more, she will say, somebody will say, it's more about the subjective involvement of the generation in the incidents that are represented. So it's, it's, it's subjective involvement that means a very powerful uh, individual feeling of connectedness to, to those events. Finally, cultural trauma and collective identity. These are sociologists. And again, as sociologists, they will have a very constructivist approach to, to, to memory and here to trauma. And they understand trauma as a process of social and cultural construction. In contrast, and they make clear the difference in contrast to individual trauma, 
Here the traumatized persons did not experience the violence firsthand. And the cause, it could be slavery, it could be the Holocaust, it could be the Francoist repression in Spain. The cause is traumatic in retrospect. So that means that a group can be traumatized, but the cause is defined as traumatic retrospectively. That's interesting. So that means that there can be generations in between that didn't consider those events as traumatic. So in contrast to any clinical understanding of the concept of trauma, the traumatic significance of an event must be socially established and accepted. And this is a process that requires time, that involves mediation and representation. It also entails a meaning struggle. And the meaning struggle is actually what we have in many societies. A meaning struggle over, the, or a struggle over the meaning of the past. And this meaning struggle involves identifying the nature of the pain, the nature of the victim, and the attribution of responsibilities. basically all how you define the event. So the fundamental aspects of the theory of cultural trauma, I, I would like to underline this, is the absence of direct experience and the centrality of the mediation and representation processes. So why do I bring all these uh, books that you can, I mean, you, you, you can look yourself in, in any library because they're, they have become um, standard books or classics in, in collective memory, because I think that they provide these conceptual tools that will help us to look at human rights from a different perspective. And that's what I'd like to do uh, now, and I'd like to show you a few examples from mainly from Spain and, and from Argentina, not only, where you see some of these approaches to memory illustrated. For instance, here. Um, Holocaust analogies with crimes committed against um, Native American population. And again, the term that I use for this is a, is, is a perspective, a representation. Uh, or here, for instance, uh, this is a very interesting uh, Argentinian uh, graphic artist, Leon, Leon Tamari. Bring it sometime. Which, he does this incredible work, graphic artist. Here it's Dante's Inferno, but what I want to show you is this. This was uh, published in Pagina 12, one of the uh, most important Argentinian papers. Pagina 12, they published the Nunca Mas report, the Truth Commission report, with illustrations of this artist. And as you see, uh, you have this analogy, you have these iconographies of. Um, Nazism, Hitler juxtaposed to Videla, the Casa Rosada, and the Department of Hitler. So basically, making clear that connection between the Holocaust, the ghost of the Holocaust, uh, in the representation of the Argentinian uh, state terror. Another example, very recent, now in January was Holocaust Memorial Day, and this is a, a headline uh, the Spanish uh, victims of the Nazis and of Franco. Actually, these were victims of Franco. They are excluded from uh, from Holocaust Memorial Day ceremony. So, what we see here is clearly that their understanding was that as victims of Francoism, they should have a place in a Holocaust Memorial ceremony. So that debate again, we have a meaning struggle over over the event, and you see that multi-directional memory clearly functioning. This is also interesting: the Stolperstein project and the Baldosas por la Memoria. Have you, anybody has seen this before in, in, in Berlin or in Argentina? Yeah. I saw those. Um, I have a picture of the same tiles. When I, um, Which in one Argentina? Did? In Argentina. Yeah. In Argentina. But let's say they, they yeah, Barbara? Argentina. And, in, in, and the German ones? Those are the um, memorial um, plates that are put in the streets. Is that correct? Yeah. These are plates or, or, or like cold stones uh, mm -hmm. that are engraved with the names of the victims, the date of their deportation to the concentration camps, 
and they're placed right in front of the houses where these people used to live. And you have it in almost every city of Germany, except Munich, because uh, the municipality thought that the real estate value of those houses would, would decrease, so they, they decided not to do that. It was a, it was a big scam at the time. But you have that in, you have that in, all, uh, in, in all Germany, and it's incredible <coughs> quite recently in Argentina, maybe in the last few years. So you have these baldosas, and what you have there is you have the, the date when people were kidnapped from that place, from their homes usually, and uh, later and detained, and detention centers, and killed, disappeared. So you, again, you have a, a connection, memorial praxis, praxis here, and a clear connection to the Holocaust. I would also like to emphasize the, the desaparecidos iconography, which is also a global traumatic memory icono iconography. You have Buenos Aires, I'm not sure, but it might be also Montevideo in the 80s. Um, the images of the Zapatillos, the photo portraits, as a symbol of the demand of justice, as a symbol of the fight against impunity, as a symbol of this human rights movement that claims truth, justice, and memory. Interestingly, you also have it in the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Yad Vashem, but in the new museum. I would say that this is, a, this is not... This is again a multidirectional memory, or this is a memory being incorporated transnationally or in iconography, but whose origins are probably in the southern Congo, in Argentina and Uruguay in the 80s, uh, in, when the Holocaust Museum was um, rebuilt in 2000, they incorporated this Tower of Faces that basically follows that photographic approach of uh, loss that also entails this, this, this clear demand you know, of this openness of and here we have the, this is, um, sorry, the, this is uh, the Museo de la Memoria in Santiago de Chile, also with a clear icon of disappearance with the photographs. So, what, what I'm interested in particularly as a sociologist, and I would probably say that this is a sociological approach to the study of human rights, is what are the displacements that are generated with these categories, with these symbols, with these iconographies, or when these frames or scripts or narratives are used? What happens? What consequences does it have for understanding the a specific episode of extreme political violence. Argentina, in Chile, in Spain, in Greece, in Guatemala. So, as I said before, human rights is a particular form of memory. It is a memory framework, or we may say it's a memory regime. That's the, the term that the Billo Krenzel, who will come as a guest of our collaborative in, in April, uses. So, it shapes our understanding of events, human rights discourse, human rights sense, shapes our understanding of events. It has consequences. It has consequences of how we understand ourselves, it has consequences on social action. It defines or creates new subjectivities, new forms of group identity and of collective action. In Spain, we see clearly that when you shift from a civil war frame, the crimes against humanity frame, that has immediate consequences on the social fabric. Or, as we have seen with, with, uh, with Anthony Robin in his talk, those of you who, if you, if you remember him, if you remember that talk, what does it imply if the term genocide is used in Argentina and he identified that this would expand the circle of accountability, it has also generational implications, and he was rather skeptical of the use of that term, a term, a human rights term, a term that is defined in, in, legally by genocide convention or by international law. He was skeptical because he said this may also open new rifts in the social, in, in societies when there are groups that might want to go beyond those who committed the crimes, but expand, as he said, the circle of accountability. So other questions that, as a sociologist, I find 
interesting in asking here, and I, 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 sh I, I think I, I tried to, to, to see if, since I know that many of you are working with human rights and memory, try to think of these questions and maybe how they can apply to your, to your, to your own research. How do descendants deal with particular histories and narratives and frames? In what ways are people of, of a current generation free to act or bound by the necessity that is uh, imposed on them by the past and the memory of this past? Do they feel responsible or don't, or, 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 or not responsible for the sins of their fathers, or concerned or even traumatized about their forebears' victimization? And also, what new forms of politics follow from this? Well, I already took 36 minutes. I wanted to do, leave it for you. It will be a bit more. It will be 45 minutes or so. Because I want to bring the case of, of Spain uh, yes, let me see. Yeah, let me. Yeah, I will. I would like to to tell you about the Spanish case because Spain and Argentina can be almost opposite countries in terms of the way of coming to terms with the past. If you think in transitional justice. Spain in the 70s. I, I don't need to talk too much about this because I think most of you know about it. Well, Spain in the 70s uh, had a, a model of transitional justice that uh, was rather, that, that didn't imply no justice. That was a sort of a, a pact of reconciliation that now is viewed as a pact of oblivion, as a pact of, of, uh, of, of denial. What you have now, in the, in the, in the last uh, decade, is a very strong social movement that has actually gone up into the political sphere that reframes Francoism. Reframes Francoism, reframes the civil war, and reframes as well the transition, the pact of transition. If the leitmotif of the transition was to look ahead in order to overcome the past, the memory movement reverses this relationship and recommends looking back. But this looking back, we may say, is infused with the present. We have again this presentism of which Halbach had already uh, uh, brought our attention to. So there are new actors, basically, basically a third generation. That's the interesting thing in the Spanish case. We're not talking about the second generation. It's the third generation here who is active. It's a third generation that has no direct experience, of course, of the events, what happened in the 30s, 40s. It's them who open the debate about the past in which the nature of the suffering, the nature of the victim, and the attribution of responsibilities has been redefined. So we have a sort of cultural trauma phenomenon here through mediation and representation processes. We may also say that it's a post-memory generation that is recovering family history, reconstructing bonds of identity where relatives were killed more than 70 years ago. And much of it is through the material connection to the grave, because it, there's this big movement of exhumations of um, uh, victims of Francoism in the last uh, 13, 14 years. So they're discovering this, in, many are discovering actually this family history and establishing a clear bond with that past and with the individuals, with, with those victimized individuals. So the generation of historical memory is inscribed, we may say in Marianne Hirsch's word, in a particular turn of the century moment marked by looking back, looking backward rather than ahead and defining the present in relation to a troubled past. It is a consequence of traumatic recall, but at that generational remove. In this case, two generations. So the past is not interpreted anymore as a civil war that calls for reconciliation and of starting a new chapter. The imperative of remembrance is now linked with the unique nature of the crimes, which are fundamentally imprescriptible, unaffected by any statute of limitation. 
and these were crimes that were committed by the Franco regime in the war and under the dictatorship, and now they're framed in the context of European fascism as well. And that's also interesting. So the process of Spanish Europeanization makes that new generation to think of those crimes in a different way. And here, for instance, you see it even in those, in, in the first generation, in testimonies, in a book, testimony book, where they will connect to global memory events, global traumatic memory, like Pinochet or the Holocaust, even using the term, terms that might not even have been known 20 or 30 years ago in Spain, like Mauthausen or Auschwitz. So, the historical memory movement is not necessarily writing a new history. That's not, that's not really it. Even if the exhumations are contributing to more exact data on the crimes committed in Frankism. But what they're doing is they're inverting the previous regime of memory. Or of forgetting, or of disremembering, that was dominant until the, name, until the late 90s in Spain. According to the movement, this was an anachronism in the European framework. Spain becomes a new member, 1986, which is also an important fact. So post-fascist Spain is portrayed as backwards and incompletely European if it doesn't address its past. And Spanish activists constantly will invoke the established and uncontested public memory of the Nazi regime in Germany. And in this light, the transition emerges as a morally unacceptable pact adopted by the political elites, leaving out what today we would define as victim rights. So what was thrown into oblivion, a channel of olvido is a, a term that uh, Spanish historian Santos Julia used, what was thrown into oblivion in, um, during the, the transition was not really the fratricidal, fratricidal, fratricidal uh, uh, fights of a civil war, but what was thrown into oblivion was a crime against humanity. And this crime not only has no statute of limitations, but also calls for the revision and even the repeal of the legislation that ignored, that ignored it, and for restitution in its full scope to the victims. And now, it goes beyond the legal, and that's the interesting thing. And as soon as we don't see, uh, there's a legal and moral and political implication here, or dimension here. If in legal terms, the crime against humanity is not subject to a statute of limitations, in moral and political terms, it is characterized by its validity and operation by its constant posing of questions to the present. What we have, in a certain ways, when Hara Arendt says that a crime that cannot be punished, cannot be forgotten, it's always there. And this type of crimes are always posing questions on the present. It's, there's never closure. So this is, that's another invitation to, to think and to discuss that concept that you can only overcome uh, the, you only can only overcome a troubled past through justice, truth, and memory. But sometimes you may leave that past always open, and that's also a question that I, I'm interested in the artistic representation. That I'm looking forward to Anna's presentation because what you have there is a way of engaging with the discipline, of making them present in the society. There's no closure in the sense that you if they look as a treatment of trauma that will end with closure, closing a chapter. And I think that's also the ghost of the Holocaust that is hovering over this other event. That there can't be closure when the crime is of such a nature. Let me finally bring a, um, something from Argentina, actually from this colleague. Not very long because he will um, he will be here very soon and we'll have the opportunity to to hear him. But Emilio Prenzel has a wonderful book which is the, the Historia Politica de Nunca Más, uh, the 
political history of, of, of the Never Again report, the Gomez report, the Truth Commission report in Argentina. And he is also a sociologist that looks at, the, at how Nunca Más adopted different frames. There were actually different narratives in the different uh, moments since 1986 when it was published. And he would say that the Nunca Más report established on the narrative level the figure of the desaparecido as an innocent victim of state terror. And here we'll come to a discussion that we had with, um, come to that in a moment, a discussion with Hernán in, in, in the symposium that you organized. What means innocent? Really. But what Kritzer argues, and there's a point here, is that the distinctive feature of the disappearances is found in the shaping of a humanitarian narrative that favors the factual description of the same. And, the and here's the important point. The definition of the victims on the basis of their main features of identity. That's a human rights discourse. Rather than their political predicaments. It's about an account that is legitimized by emphasizing the innocence. And in that sense also the absence of agency of those who are victims because they endured violations of their rights. That's why they are victims, they endured violations of their rights. The fact that they were militants doesn't make them less victims from a human rights perspective. Right? But this code probably expressed a major cultural and political change of direction with respect to previous traditions of a large part of its characters. What are the traditions of these fairies? But these people didn't ever think of themselves as victims. They saw themselves as combatants. Most of them, not all. <coughs> and that was the discussion that this uh, Chilean colleague said also. We fought a war and we lost it. But he said, I don't like this emphasis in victimhood because it was our struggle. Don't define us as victims. So, as victims lacking any agency. But of course it's difficult, because when you say we fought a war and we lost it, you're basically adopting the same, from a different perspective, you're adopting the same memory narrative as the perpetrators. This was a war, and we had to fight this war and we won it. So, you see the differences. Andreas Huizen has a very nice article on, on Argentina for 2004, and he gives reason for regarding this type of memory as forgetting. Because the political dimension of the leftist insurgency, the insurgency, it, sorry, insurgency that the military dictatorship was trying to root out is forgetting, is forgotten. And this form of forgetting, however, differs from repression or denial. And it is a memorialist discourse. So let me round up the, the argument. At the same time, with the adoption of a language linked with the Holocaust, the political history of the conflict recedes or is forgotten. Which is the main difference from the example that it takes as a model. It is fundamentally different. The events are very different, incomparable. So, I'm not a historian, but the question is, there is an analytical price that we pay for memory. We simplify. And the human rights narrative, narrative in that sense, is also a simplification of a very complex history. And you have many historians writing in Spain and Argentina that say, this is memory at the expenses of history. So. Well, these are concerns for the historian, definitely. What I'm interested in is that the workings of memory. What we see is one, collective remembering and collective forgetting are part of the same process. It's selective remembrance. It's as uh, Renan said no, about France, uh, that uh, uh, we have to, uh, just, well, selective remembrance and certain things have to be forgotten. in order not to be divisive. 
Uh, and secondly, there is always an instrumentalization of memory. Always. It could be for better or for worse. But this is an inherent feature of its public production. So if we look again, memoria, verdad, justicia, we have here a centralized category. There is no such a thing as one verdad, as untruth. There might be different forms of justice, as we know from transitional justice. And memory in itself is a particular way of looking at the past from the present. So finally, human rights, a new memory regime. And here, this idea from no pasarán to nunca más. I think somehow, no pasarán and nunca más, they both embody the shift towards, I mean, from nunca más, to, from no pasarán to nunca más, embodies a shift towards this new memory regime, which is the nunca más memory regime, the human rights regime. Um, from an epic, heroic narrative to a tragic narrative, a negative foundation moment, that's the Nunca Mas, that's the Holocaust. From agency to victimhood, from war and conflict to genocide and mass atrocity, from social struggle to human rights, and on the individual level, from the guerrilla fighter to the human rights activist. Think of Granito. We have a guerrilla fighter that becomes a human rights activist and is responsible for the, for the police archive. Finally, we have categories that are transhistorical, that are centered around the, the notion of the victim, of the trauma, and these are universal categories. Supposedly, trauma happens equally, regardless of context, of nation, of or culture, which is something, as sociologists, we have to take with care. We have to look closely. And that's why the Holocaust allows to function as a bridging metaphor in all these cases. The Holocaust is, in that sense, this ghost. And the dissimilarity between the events are here less relevant through the notion of trauma and victimhood. That's what comes to the foreground, to the center stage. And it also reaches beyond the immediate victims and hovers over the new generations. Here is this question of closure that I, I don't have closure from my, from my lecture here. I leave it open as many questions and uh, I look forward to, to discussing it. Thank you.